You're listening to The Uncommon Engineer. I'm your host, Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the College. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. Welcome to the Uncommon Engineer podcast. I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering. Our podcast is all about how Georgia Tech engineers make a difference in our world and in our daily lives. In this episode, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity. Today, cybercrime is everywhere, and no one is immune. Last year's Equifax breach left millions of people exposed to identity theft. Facebook is selling our data for political gain. And the city of Atlanta just had a ransomware attack demanding payment. Cybercrime is rampant. Our guest today is Professor Brendan Saldaformaggio, professor in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Georgia Tech. He's at the top of his field of data security and cyber forensics, and he's literally developing programs to fight both cybercrime and real human crime. Welcome to the program, Brendan. Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. Uh, you hear so much today about privacy, about cybercrime. In fact, we even, and I know it's one of the areas you worked in, when someone has an iPhone that someone else wants to get in to see what happened maybe during a crime. All of those things are out there today. Can you give us a summary of the kind of things that you're interested in and that you're working on here at Georgia Tech? Well, you hit the nail on the head. Digital devices like iPhones or Android devices, people's computers, these are all being employed in crimes that are being investigated every day by the FBI or local law enforcement. And extracting evidence from these devices is a very challenging task. And it takes experts many uh, weeks or months to be able to recover all of that evidence. And so the research that's near and dear to my heart is coming up with better techniques, better tools to allow our law enforcement to better investigate crimes, get those results out uh, as quickly as they can so that they can investigate what happened. When someone commits a crime, say with a phone, can't they just turn off the phone or even, you know, erase their phone and everything's going away? Isn't that a pretty simple way for a criminal to avoid being detected or being tracked? <laughs> That's a very common uh, misconception. Data tends to stay around far longer than you would expect. Even after deleting files or turning off your phone, investigators can still recover an incredible amount of information about what the suspects were doing on the device. Uh, but don't worry, these uh, investigation techniques always come after a warrant has been served. So you can usually trust your own privacy um, just as long as you don't commit a crime. So you talked about being able to reconstruct say, on a phone, you know, the activities of a criminal, even when they've, you know, turned off their phone and erased their phone. Can you talk a little bit more about the specifics of, of what's going on in your research group, the kind of work that your students are doing, and more importantly, what's the, what's the cutting edge in that field? In my lab right now, we're working on a number of these sort of state-of-the-art forensics techniques. One I can give you a pretty cool example of. It turns out as you're using your phone, say an Android device, every time you are pressing a button or changing the screen, in the background, Android is kind of scribbling down little notes about what you've been doing so that the next time you do it, it can do it even faster, it can do it even better for you, the screens will load more quickly, because everyone likes a, an Android phone that runs faster, right? Uh, this, is a good, this is a good thing in the system. But as an investigator, if I can get access to those little notes that Android has been jotting down, I can use that to reconstruct uh, some sequence of activities that you've done on your device. And so my students right now, some of my best PhD students, are coming up with techniques to recover those little notes and be able to translate them out of Android's own little language into a way that investigators can actually use them as tangible evidence in a case. So you're saying... For example, if the criminal was working on a particular app on the phone and saw the police coming and deleted the app thinking that whatever activity they were doing, you're saying the little notes that, that Android's keeping will give an indication of what they're doing, even if they've deleted the app. Let me give you a case study that we did in my lab. We simulated all this, of course. This is not a real crime being committed. But let's say you had a self-driving car and you turned on the self-driving feature. 
and then you opened up Netflix on your phone and started watching a movie. Now toddle off and fly your flying machine, darling. But if you see any more flying saucers, will you tell them to pick another house to buzz? Be careful. Don't worry about me. Oh, you're the only thing I do worry about. Oh, this is illegal about in every state, of course. But you then get into an accident. The police can, once they receive a warrant, get those little notes that Android's been jotting down. Even if you were smart enough to uninstall Netflix before the police came to your window, they'd still be able to find that you had done these activities. Maybe you could say a little bit more about uh, so-called malware, where I believe someone would, unknown to you, install software on your device. Can you say a little bit more about what that is, the kind of work that might be going on in your, your group, and kind of what the cutting edge of understanding that uh, malware? So malware is a piece of computer code that's written specifically by an attacker with some kind of malicious intent. They're really looking to do harm to you or to your systems in a way that you definitely don't want them to be able to do. In my lab, we're looking at kind of tearing these malware samples down and figuring out at the lowest levels, what are they trying to do? What's the goal of this large scale cyber attack? So some techniques that we've been looking at are how do you take a malware sample, just this piece of computer code, and actually analyze it in a way that human investigators can get ahead of the attack. They can get some idea of why the attacker wanted to infect their systems. What was the motive of this attack? What was the end goal? goal of this attack. And this is strangely a very related and orthogonal problem to the cyber forensics work that we talked about before, in that now you're basically interrogating a piece of computer code instead of interrogating a human suspect. And I understand that you've developed some tools to help uh, companies like Apple find and maybe even analyze malware. Can you say something about that? So something that my group's been looking at for a while is being able to remove malware that has infected legitimate applications. So a company like Apple or Google, they host these big app stores where you go and you download the apps. And regular consumers need to be able to trust that when they download these apps, they are safe and they're doing exactly what they say they're doing. If I'm an attacker, I want to undermine that trust and try to get my malicious code into these apps that you think are safe. And so my group is working on ways of pulling apart these apps and basically distilling out the safe pieces and removing the malicious pieces if they've been able to work their way in. And this can help big companies like Apple and Google because they would want to deploy these sorts of techniques at the app store level so that even before an application gets down to users, they can vet it and they can make sure that it's safe. Can you say a little bit more about privacy and the work that might be going on in your group in that area? Personal data is really becoming the new digital currency. Companies which can collect the most data on their users and explain their users' behavior and understand their users best, this is really going to be the competitive advantage of the future. And so a lot of the work going on in my group is trying to protect that personal data that people are either sharing or unknowingly sharing with companies. I say privacy might be dead, well, mostly because you hear about Facebook and you hear about all of these ways of people finding out your private information. What kind of advice would you give to people to better protect their privacy? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, Steve. We've all gotten so used to giving over our data en masse to companies like Facebook and Google. Uh, we post pictures of our kids and what we had for breakfast. This data is being collected uh, by these companies and used basically to build profiles of everyone. A lot of times just for good uh, so that they can better suggest where you should go eat dinner tonight based on maybe what you had for breakfast, uh, but also sometimes for reasons that you wouldn't expect just uh, in the beginning as a normal Facebook user. You would see cases where big companies are selling this data to uh, analytics branches to uh, try to predict who you may vote for or uh, other uses that you wouldn't have condoned ahead of time. You're right in saying that privacy may be on its last leg because we are giving up so much information. If you are cautious about this, you just have to be very thoughtful about what you share and how you share it. One of the things that happened uh, in Atlanta just a couple weeks ago was a ransomware attack. Can you highlight what ransomware attacks are and maybe what kind of work is going on in your lab around preventing or identifying it? 
Sure, ransomware is a very hot new trend, you could say, in cyber attacks. So just like I mentioned that personal data is the new currency for companies, which may be interested in knowing more about their users, users are also willing to pay large sums of money in some cases in order to protect their data from attackers. And that's exactly what ransomware gets at. This is a piece of malware that, when it infects your computer, it goes through and steals and encrypts all of the personal data that it can find on your system, and then literally asks you for a ransom in order to get your own data back. And this can be a problem infecting just a normal person's computer. But we've seen these attacks targeting cities, like the city of Atlanta, or hospitals, or entire corporations. And when you've got that kind of critical data under the control of an attacker, your hands are really tied as to what you can do. So my lab has been aggressively looking into techniques to thwart these sorts of attacks before they can really take place, looking at ways to detect ahead of time large amounts of data being stolen or being looked at, being sized up perhaps for a future ransomware attack. And by going off of those triggers, we can inoculate the systems against these sorts of attacks ahead of time. And this can really give an advantage to a large computer network like, say, the city of Atlanta, who definitely does not want to have their data a ransomed ever again. The ransomware attacks that, that you're talking about are really, really scary. Back to, and you had described previously, the work on malware where you have tools to go in and identify software or parts of software that are you know, not doing the right thing. Is the ransomware really dissimilar to that in terms of just identifying portions of code that are doing things that lead towards ransom. Is that is that really what happens in this, or does it require a more specialized skill? That's a really great question. Let me tell you about a cool project that's going on in my lab right now. So let's say you have this piece of malware that you're not sure exactly what it does, but you want to learn ahead of time what it does so you can detect when it's infecting a system. I have some PhD students and master's students collaborating right now to build an environment where you can run that malware and actually watch it execute in a controlled environment. And then, Based on the traces of that execution, apply machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques to automatically build a model of that malware's behavior. So that in the future, if you see those same models popping up on a network, you can get out ahead of that attack and start stopping the spread of that malware before it becomes a big problem. All of that, uh, that work sounds incredibly uh, interesting. What are the kinds of agencies or companies that you're working with that have interest in this? So we work very closely with a number of antivirus companies. In particular, we have connections to Symantec and the research labs that are out there, as well as the Endpoint Protection Division over at Microsoft. And these are really large corporations who specialize in detecting and preventing these sorts of cyber attacks. And they look to new techniques like the ones coming out of my group to just keep pushing forward that state-of-the-art in virus detection. You know, I have to say, the, um, whether we're talking about malware, whether we're talking about privacy, all that is really, really scary stuff. For, you know, uh, for my generation, we're really used to uh, the kind of privacy. You know, my son, you know, because he grew up in the Facebook generation, is less concerned about, about privacy, so I, I get that. Looking into your crystal ball, what do you see five or 10 or 20 years down the road? What does the world really look like in terms of the tools to combat cybercrime as well as protecting individuals' privacy? Where do you see we're headed? So that sounds like a two-part question, and I'm going to give you a two-part answer. First, in the future for privacy, I do see companies getting much better about giving control back to consumers and allowing you to choose what personal information they store on you. This is a good thing for everybody because everyone's going to want to continue to share this information with the companies and continue to use their applications and their tools. This is really improving the world in many different ways. But we are going to have to address this double-edged sword of what data do we allow the companies to store on us and how can we get control back. On the flip side, the current state of cyber attack prevention is a bit bleak. We're in a very reactive state right now where an attack will happen and then investigators will get called and then we'll have to figure out what happened after the glass is already on the floor. This doesn't make much sense and in the future 
research like mine, I hope, will give us the ability to detect and prevent these attacks before they become widespread and really take down entire networks. Well, the you know the future in terms of privacy and cybercrime, you, you paint a, a, a hopeful picture. If you had just two or three things to give to a high school student or to a college student or, or to any one of our listeners, what would you suggest in terms of both protecting privacy and um, avoiding cybercrime? One of the best things you can do to protect yourself in the cyber world is just be cognizant of the data that you are sharing. You never want to reuse passwords or give them out. Any link that you click, be sure you know what website is on the other side of that link. And really, this does hint at a larger shift in the way that we think about interacting with computers. One of the best things you can practice is just being responsible with the data that you share. So a good example of this is Microsoft will never call you and ask you for your password. Sharing this type of very sensitive data should never be done. Can you say a little bit about how you chose engineering and how you became an electrical engineer, computer scientist? Can you share a little bit about your own personal path? It actually did begin in elementary school. Uh, I remember my family had uh, one of those old school modems that you would hear from a block away dialing up when you were connecting to the internet. And I was just full of curiosity uh, what these sounds were and why was it making them. And uh, I guess it was from that age that I became an engineer because I quickly tore that thing apart in order to figure that out. From there, I learned how to code, and that gave me the ability to really create these new software applications that were in my head but just didn't exist before. It wasn't until undergraduate that I developed an interest in cybersecurity when I realized that the code we were writing contained so many vulnerabilities that we just weren't aware of. Most programming courses focus on the fundamentals and how to build systems and only spend a little bit of time on actually coding securely. And from there, I developed my interest in how we can protect these systems from cyber attacks. And finally, I know our listeners would love to know, what makes you an uncommon engineer? <laughs> well, I'm not sure how uncommon it is, but I was born and raised in New Orleans, and so I can't go a year without getting back there for Mardi Gras. Have a good time now. Welcome to paradise. Best golf course in the world. Watch the alligators. Well, thanks so much to Professor Brendan Saltformaggio for your time here today talking about cybercrime, cybersecurity. Thanks for having me. Be sure to tune in next month where we'll talk to Professor Pat Mokhtarian about sustainable transportation and travel behavior. <laughs>